Now the data node is that component of HDFS which is responsible for storing the HDFS data blocks. Now on any production cluster, there would be large number of data nodes running on separate servers. Now as we already saw in the previous session, each replica of the HDFS block is represented by two files on the local file system. The first file contains the data itself and the second file records the block metadata information which includes the checksum and generation stamp. Also there is one more important concept that you should know which is the replication factor. Now each HDFS block is actually replicated across multiple data nodes. This provides fault tolerance and integrity to the data stored on HDFS. Now the default replication factor is 3 which means each HDFS data block will have 3 copies stored on 3 different data nodes. Now the value of the replication factor is configurable and can be set by the parameter dfs.replication on the HDFS configuration file. Now remember, increasing the replication factor will increase the fault tolerance capacity of your HDFS. However, it will drastically reduce the usable storage space as you will be allocating an equal amount of space for storing copies or replicas. Now let us talk about the data node registration process during name node startup. During a name node startup, the data node contacts the name node to perform a handshake. This includes sharing some identifiers like the cluster ID, block pool ID and the namespace ID. The name node verifies these identifiers before sending out a registration confirmation. If the name node finds the identifiers to be invalid, it will infer that a rogue node is trying to join the cluster and will send out a kill signal to the data node process on the server. Now it is important to understand that the name node does not have any data node information during startup and hence will not reach out to the data nodes. The data nodes on the other hand have the name node information in their HDFS configuration file and hence will try to reach out to the name node first for registration. Now let me talk a little bit about the various identifiers which is the cluster ID, block pool ID and the namespace ID. These are the unique identifiers of a HDFS cluster. These identifiers are used to prevent data node from accidentally registering with the wrong name node that is part of a different cluster or a different namespace. Now the namespace ID and the block pool ID are particularly important in a federated deployment. Now we will be covering the topic of name node federation in the later sessions. However, for now just know that within a federated deployment, there are multiple name nodes that work independently. Each name node serves a unique portion of the namespace identified by the namespace ID and manages a unique set of block identified by the block pool ID. The cluster ID ties the whole cluster together into one logical unit and must be same across all the nodes in the cluster. Now immediately after the registration process is complete, the data nodes will send out a block report to the name node. Now the data nodes send this report to identify all the block replicas in their possession to the name node. A block report contains the block ID, the generation stamp and the length of each block replica that is hosted on that particular data node. Remember that I told you I'll explain how name node generates its block address table later. Well this is how. The name node populates its block address table with the data it receives from all the various block reports submitted by the data nodes. Now unlike the namespace which is directly loaded from the FS image during startup, the name node actually rebuilds its block address table from scratch every time it restarts. Now during startup, the name node will be in safe mode until a specified threshold of blocks have been registered. The duration for which the name node is in safe mode during startup can somewhat be controlled or configured using the parameters safe mode.threshold percentage and safe mode.extension. The first parameter specifies the percentage of blocks that should satisfy the minimal replication requirement, which in this case is 1. So this basically tells that the name node will remain in safe mode until 99% of the blocks registered have at least one replica. The second parameter specifies the extension of safe mode in seconds to let the remaining replicas check in before the name node can start its normal operations. You can see whether the name node is in safe mode or not from the first screen on the name node UI. The data nodes also do send subsequent block reports at periodic time intervals. The time interval can be specified under the parameter block report dot interval millisecond. Now apart from the block report, all data nodes send periodic heartbeats to the name node to notify that they are alive and operational. The heartbeats also carry information about the total storage capacity and the used and available space statistics for that particular node. The default time interval for the heartbeats is 3 seconds. However, it can be configured using the heartbeat.interval parameter. 
Now the name node performs a periodic review of its block address table to find out any under or over replicated blocks and to fix them. This is also one of the reason why the name node needs to be in safe mode during startup. This is to prevent the name node from prematurely start replicating under replicated blocks even though all the blocks are yet to be registered. If a data node skips sending consecutive heartbeats, the name node will mark it stale. This basically means that the data node is slow and will be prioritized less for read and write operations. However, if a data node misses sending heartbeat for an extended period of time, the name node will mark it dead or out of operation. Now, if a data node becomes dead for any reason, it can cause some of the blocks becoming under-replicated. The name node will then schedule these blocks to be replicated to another active data node. Now here is our single node Apache Hadoop system that I used in the earlier sessions. I haven't launched the HDFS services yet which you can check using the JPS command. The first thing I want to show you guys is the data node registration process during name node startup. Let me first move into the logs directory which you can find under the path where you have installed the Hadoop binaries which in this case is user local Hadoop. Here I will move into the directory logs and there you go. Here you will find all the log files for each of the Hadoop services. Now I will be emptying out the log files of all the old logs so that it is easy for us to read the new logs that are captured when we launch the HDFS services. Once this is done, let me launch the HDFS services on this node. The script will be the same, that is the start dfs.sh. This script will basically launch the HDFS services one by one. That is the name node, the data nodes and the secondary name node. Let me fast forward a little bit till the time the services are fully operational and then we will analyze the logs to understand the data node registration process. Now the server has started listening to the name node port 50070 which means our name node UI is up. So let us monitor the startup progress from the UI itself. On the UI select the startup progress tab. Here you can see that the initial checkpoint is completed and currently the name node is waiting for the data blocks to report which will only happen after the data nodes have successfully registered themselves with the name node. Right now, no data nodes have registered themselves. Also, if you move to the overview tab, you can see here that the safe mode is on. As already mentioned before, the name node will be in safe mode until a specified percentage of data blocks have been registered. Now, let me fast forward till the data nodes have registered successfully. Now here you can see that our data node has been successfully registered. Again, if you move to the startup progress tab, you will see that all the data blocks have been reported to the name node. Also, the name node is out of safe mode and is fully operational. Now let us analyze the logs to understand the data node registration process. Now the log file in question is the data node Hadoop itnoobs.log. I'm going to open the file and search only for info logs and pipe it to the less command so that it's easy to browse through the file. As you can see, there's a lot of things going on here. Initially, it is basically allocating the system resources and ports and starting up the data node JVM. Now I will search for the keyword register Here you go. As you can see here at 16.23.30, the data node is beginning handshake with the name node. As already explained, the handshake involves sharing of the identifiers which the name node validates before sending out a confirmation. Here almost immediately, the data node receives a successful registration confirmation. Now these are the parameters we have set like block report interval, the heartbeat interval, the initial delay, etc. Just note that the initial delay parameter is delay in milliseconds for sending out the first block report, which in this case is zero, which means the data node will immediately send out the block report after a successful registration. 
you can see here that the data node sends its first block report to the name node. Now the data node does send periodic block reports after this. Also, if you check the debug logs, you can find the periodic heartbeats that the data node sends every three seconds. Now let's see what happens on the name node side. Now we will open the name node log file using the same command we used earlier. Now let me search the keyword data node. Here you go. As you can see here, at exactly 16.23.30, the name node logs a successful data node registration. Now the data node UUID and the storage ID are internal identifiers of the data node, which makes it recognizable even if it is restarted with a different IP. These are assigned to the data node when it registers to the name node for the first time and do not change. Apart from this, we have the cluster ID, which as I already explained, must be same for all the nodes on the cluster. Now you can see here that almost immediately the name node receives the first block report from the data node. Next, the name node processes the block report where it checks the number of blocks, under and over replicated blocks, invalid blocks, etc. Also, if you see here, once the specified threshold of blocks have registered, the name node transitions from safe mode onto the safe mode extension stage. This is the time the safe mode needs to be extended to allow the remaining blocks to be to register themselves. Once the extension time is up, the name node will transition to fully operational state. Remember, you can configure this in the HDFS site.xml file. By default, the extension period is 30 seconds. Next, I want to show you guys the replication factor. As already mentioned, the default replication factor can be mentioned in the HDFS site.xml file. Let me open the file here, which will be under user local Hadoop. The ETC Hadoop. There you go. You can see here that I have configured the replication factor for our Hadoop cluster to be one. This is no surprise since our cluster has only one data node. Now remember that you can change the replication factor for a file on HDFS overriding the default configuration either before or even after copying the file into HDFS. We will discuss more about this in the later session when we do some practicals on HDFS. You can see the replication factor of a file using the HDFS ls command. Here the second column shows the replication factor for that file. A dash here denotes that it is a directory. Even better is the HDFS fsck command, which I'll execute with the options uh, files, blocks, locations, racks. Here you can see all the blocks, their locations, their replication and their rack. Now we will be discussing the topic on rack awareness in Hadoop in later sessions. So just ignore that for now. Down here, you can see the default replication factor for the file and the average replication factor. Now, when you change the default replication factor, it only applies to the new blocks and does not change the replication of existing blocks. In such cases, the default and average replication factors might have different values. You can set the replication factor of an existing file using the HDFS set rep command. Here you go. Now we have set the replication factor to one for this particular file. Note, however, changing the replication factor for a directory only affects the existing files and new files in the directory will be created with the default replication factor. Lastly, I want to show you guys where the identifiers that is the cluster ID, namespace and block IDs are stored on name node as well as data nodes. And what would happen if a data node with the wrong cluster ID tries to join the cluster? First, I will switch to the name node data directory. In this case, it is slash Hadoop disk one slash name. 
now move into current here you will see a file named version let us open the file here you can see the namespace id the cluster id and the block pool id for the name node Now similarly, let's switch to the data nodes data directory, which in our case is slash HDFS disk one data. Again, switch to current. Here you can see a version file. By opening the file, you will find that it stores the cluster ID for the data node. However, the namespace ID and the block pool ID would be stored on a separate versions files inside the block pool directory, since it will be different for different block pools. Now in our case, we only have one block pool. So let's move into the block pool directory. Again, switch to current. Here you can see another version file which stores the block pool and namespace ID for this particular block pool. Now just to show you guys what happens when a data node has invalid cluster ID, I'm going to purposely change the cluster ID of this data node and start the HDFS services, which by the way, I have stopped for now. Let me just change this zero to one and see what happens. Save and close the file. Now let's start the HDFS services. Now you can see that all the three HDFS JVMs have been launched. However, once the data node tries to register with the name node, the name node will detect the wrong cluster ID and will infer a rogue node trying to join the cluster. It will then send out a signal asking to stop the data node JVM. Hence, in a few minutes, you should see the data node JVM will be dead. Let me fast forward a little. Here you go. You can see now that the data node JVM is no longer active. Let us go through the logs to find out what actually happened. I will open the data node log file and see the last thousand lines. Let me browse till the end. Here you can see the data node has been shut down. If I go little up, Here you go. You can see here the cluster ID incompatible message. This tells us that the data node could not validate its cluster ID with the name node. Now we have reached the end of session four. In the next sessions, we'll discuss about name node high availability and talk a little more about HDFS administration. Till then, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.